anyone familiar with my channel will know that my preferred flavour of cars is tiny cars. Not only are they more efficient and take up less room, but on a back road, small cars are lighter, more agile and allow you to have genuine fun at reasonable speeds. They're just better. And it's for these reasons I deify the likes of the MG Midget and the Japanese K sports cars. But once upon a time, Europe had a go at one too, and its name is the Smart Roadster. Before we begin, Twinkam is proudly supported by Bidding Classics, the new online classic car marketplace featuring an array of cool and interesting old cars, much like this Malcolm Sayer designed hunk of 12 cylinder goodness. So if you'd like to get yourself a toy for the summer, then please do follow the link in the description. As an entity, the affordable sports car is always perceived to be in some kind of existential crisis. If we travel back to the 1960s, we begin with safety concerns, followed by the oil crisis, and finally the rise of the hot hatch. After this, the sports car lay almost dormant for a decade, only to be revived and reinvigorated in the 90s, all thanks to Mazda. Since then though, it's rather returned to the doldrums, with recessions and electrification not helping the cause. But right at the end of the Miata-led revival, the little smart roadster came from nowhere to compete directly with nothing, and it was good. But if it wasn't an MX-5, MG or S2000 competitor, then why on earth does this thing exist? Smart started out life not as a subsidiary of Daimler as we've come to know them, but as a joint venture between the Germans and Swatch. You know, the Swiss timepiece manufacturer. In the early 90s, Daimler-Benz was looking to forge out a new city car executive class, the kind personified by the Smart and BMW's Mini in the following decade. But simultaneously, Swatch was beginning to lose its image and needed something to enhance its youthful chic status. The Swiss had been courting their way around the European motor industry for years already, joining forces with Daimler in 94. Together, they built a factory in France to produce a new car that was unlike anything else on the road, and in 1998, they launched the Smart City Coupe. But while a lot of people went flinging their arms around applauding its concept car style and proclaiming it to be the future of personal city transport, the reality was really rather different. The car itself wasn't all it was cracked up to be, causing Swatch to abandon it, and in a separate issue, necessitating emergency modifications to its stability. But we're only about to throw more fuel onto the fire, as despite a strong public image and exceptional product awareness, Smart was hemorrhaging money. Surprisingly, Building a factory and designing a radical and all new car was expensive. And because the City Coupe had a limited customer base, they had to expand the formula. The original Smart was renamed the 42, and it was joined by the more mundane 44 and, of course, the Roadster. While the 44 was the one they imagined would sell in decent numbers, the Roadster was the car they envisioned as their halo, enamouring them to car enthusiasts the world over and realising the potential of Smart as a quirky and unique small car manufacturer. However, the 44 was a very conventional car. It was based on the Mitsubishi Colt and built at Nedcar, the old Volvo DAF factory in the Netherlands, which meant it was cheap to conceive and build. But back to the 42, and they just spent a shed load of money on this all new engineering and all new production facilities with very little to show for it, and that meant the Roadster would be crafted from the parts bin. This car was truly designed on a shoestring, but it's arguable that if the economic situation had been different, the Roadster wouldn't have existed in the first place. The 42 had its initial stability issues, but once fixed, it became a decent car. But you never describe it as sporty, and that's because of its high centre of gravity and tiny wheelbase. So when you alter those values to those of a proper car, the attitude is revolutionised. 
It's at this point you'd expect me to go into the engineering and go for a drive. But there are more important things to discuss first, because look at this car. Look at that face. It's adorable, weird, striking and aggressive in all different measures. I don't think there's any doubt that this is the best looking car Smart have ever made. The original for 2 and for 4 aren't exactly lookers, and the less said about the new ones, the better. But despite that, there is a family appearance between this, the for 4 and the facelifted for 2 in the headlamps, and with the expanses of black plastic, as well as, of course, the accented safety cell that peeks out of the plastic bodywork. But with proportions that actually work, and a sense of unashamed expression, it's fabulously concept car-like. And there's a reason for that. As the Roadster was created just as the City Coupe came into existence to go on display at the Frankfurt Motor Show in 1999. It was a further four years before it was launched, and during development, Smart went through three design directors. But barring minor details, the concept made production. This car is actually a Smart Roadster Coupe which is much the same thing, but with a big glass house on the back that I think removes a lot of the chunkiness of the standard Roadster, but regardless, I can't get enough of the three-spoke alloy wheels, the googly eyes and the huge wheel arches, so big they define the profile of the whole front end. It seems to be timeless as well. It's now 20 years since this car was launched, and you could relaunch it today without anyone batting an eyelid. And finally, it's time for the meat. The pedants among you might take offence at my reference to K cars, and that would be fair because this isn't one. It's 27mm too long and 176mm too wide, but the little Hondas from the late 60s didn't meet K regulations either, and the philosophy is very much here, because mounted right at the back is a teeny tiny turbocharged 698cc three cylinder. Listen to that little thing chirping away back there. And the reason for that tiny engine placement is, of course, because everything is shared with the 4 2, tail waggling engine placement and all. The M160, as this engine was known, was available in a K regulation capacity, but as the road is a bit too wide, it was never fitted in this car. They were all 698 and available either with 62 brake horsepower or 82 brake horsepower. And I'm pleased to say this is a more powerful one, and of course that is a relative term, but the Roadster feels so alive because First of all, it's tiny. It weighs less than 800 kilograms as well. And because the engine itself is only a little three-cylinder, single-cam, six-valve job, there's only 59 kilograms worth of pendulum. <laughs> we all know that three-cylinder engines are brilliant. They're thrummy, so incredibly rough, but characterful immensely characterful and it just thrums away like a, li a mini a mini flat six even it so suits a sports car this engine and with the turbocharger i so hope you can hear that but every time you lift off the throttle it flutters away at you it's spectacular it is just brimming with character brimming with the stuff. <laughs> and even in front of me are one of, the, one of these little winking gauges. I've got a boost gauge. So I can see that I'm pulling one and a half bar of boost. How spectacular. What I will say though, is that the power band is incredibly narrow, and so you've absolutely got to keep it. 
above 3000 RPM really to get any kind of puff out of it. As I said, it really is dependent on getting it on boost because beneath 3000 RPM it doesn't do anything. You might have noticed there when I flipped the car around that I put my foot down and it built. There wasn't much there until we hit 3000, the turbo comes on and then we're flying. But that isn't to say that the Roadster is slow because it's not. The car weighs so little that 82 brake horsepower is a lot. I think we're forgetting that back in the early 80s, the Fiesta XR2 had 84 brake horsepower, two more than this, and it weighed about the same, and that was considered quite a fast car. Even on this small back road in the Lake District, we're being held up by traffic, so. We're just sat dancing between five and six and a half thousand revs. And again, we're doing 45 miles per hour. You can't not absolutely adore the way it delivers its power. Character, character is everything in cars because you can have a car that is so incredibly able on paper that has a massive team of really well-regarded engineers behind it. But you can engineer the character out totally. And that makes a car feel a bit rubbish in ways. This, on the other hand, just bashing through the gears. <laughs> what a car! You'd think that with the engine at the back, there'd be some space inside, but there isn't. This being a coupe means there's a little more room, but whatever you do put in the boot is then on show to everyone. Nobody would have expected a set of rear seats in a car so tiny, but we could have expected something of a box in front of the engine like in a Beetle or an Imp, but there's nothing. Fortunately at the front, there is a decently sized space for a few soft bags, but it's hardly a holiday car. That being said, the two boots mean it is actually more practical than an MX-5. And it's probably just as practical as an MGF, though the shapes are a little more compromised. There is a lot of compromise in here, and a few K sports cars don't suffer from the same quality issues, but for a proper two-seat sports car, it's a small price to pay. It's a small price to pay because this little thing dances. Of course, being on the same platform as the 42, the suspension is about the same as that in the 42. So at the front are a set of first and struts. Fine. And at the back, curiously, is a coil located De Dion tube. Now this is quite modern for a De Dion tube and we have encountered them before on Twin Cam in cars like the original Alfa Romeo GTV6, so it's a suspension setup with pedigree. But what it means is that it acts like a dead axle. So it maintains, again the torque, there's none of it. There you go, 3000 RPM. <laughs> so, the Dion tube, anyway, as I was saying, it's coil located and it acts as a dead axle, keeping the camber angles of the rear wheels in line at all times. This is the Colin Chapman philosophy, the simplify and add lightness, because this is light, this is simple and it feels so much better for it. But the car in general is still intriguing in a sense because it squeaks and rattles everywhere. There is not a sense that this is only 20 years old. It feels 60 years old, but it's a sports car. And so that's good. 
in my head, sports cars as a genre aren't really comparable with just their own, you know, their own contemporaries. They're comparable with everything that's ever come in the field. And when you look at this car and then sit in and drive this car, though the engine is modern in its character, I keep relating it to Austin Healey Sprite's MG Midgets because it's so happy. It feels so eager to just say, come on then, ring me round and I'll put a massive smile on your face. And I get to watch a boost gate dancing up and down. I'm starting to mince my words here because this car is just making me smile so much that I'm not thinking about you lot. I'm thinking about me and my own personal enjoyment in this thing. And to add to this engine's pedigree, though it's nothing special on paper, it's a twin spark design. So despite the fact that it only has three cylinders, it's got six spark plugs. So there you go, so there's some Alfa Romeo creeping into our French built and Mercedes designed little tiny Roadster. The Roadster has electric power steering and I've seen quite a bit of hate for its steering system, but I think it's a sense of compromise because while there isn't very much feeling in the steering, there is a lot of feeling in the chassis. And so it kind of one compensates for the other a bit. And so while I'm driving this around, while I wish in many ways that it didn't have power steering and that it felt really alive and between my fingers, like that engine feels under my right foot, the rest of the chassis is so taut. And that's not to say that it's uncomfortable, but just that it feels so well controlled. However, the Roadster has one massive fault, and that's its gearbox. Because a sports car should have a manual gearbox, that's a given. And this does have a manual gearbox, but it's a six speed automated manual. So it's sequentially controlled by me, but there's a computer from 20 years ago operating the clutch. And that means you get the worst of both worlds. You don't get the smoothness of an automatic and you don't get the manual control of a manual. And you've got to use it a lot because as I said, this engine has no puff whatsoever below, like there you go, I've been caught at two and a half thousand revs, there's nothing, shift down, get to three and then we go again. You get caught an awful lot in the wrong gear in this car, which means you have to use this six-speed gearbox a lot. Now there is a fully automatic mode, but why you'd use it, I don't know, because it's always in the wrong gear. Instead, I'm using the manual mode here, so I am flicking between the gears, and fault number one, apart from its existence, is the fact that it's the wrong way around. So you push forward to go up a gear and pull back to go down, which is wrong. You should pull towards you to go up. So that's wrong. But much worse than that, of course, is the speed at which it changes, because you can tell this is a good road. I've seen a couple of BMW M cars. There's an M2 just gone past. Anyway, gearbox. It takes its time. So I'm sat in fourth gear at three and a half thousand, three seven fifty RPM, and I want to go down to third um, to have fun. Change. There you go. That's how long it takes for this thing to change down. It's ridiculous. And again to third. Now it's there. You can feel just very subtly the clutch engage, and it means also that when you do try and change down because you're in the wrong gear, you've lost so much momentum now that you're two gears out, so you need to change down again. But it's taken so long to change down again that you've got to change down a further time. It's so potentially car ruining this. Why couldn't they have just given it a manual? Silly car, silly car. So we've gone over down changes. Let's now see the up changes. So we've caught up traffic, so I will go down to first gear. First has just engaged. So you can hear it when I click into the next gear. You can't quite see it, but you'll hear it. 
and I'll mention it. I'll say when it's changed and when I get my power back. So let's go now. Change. Power. You can, it just feels like you've got a slipping clutch. It's just stupid, monumentally stupid. And it so nearly ruins this car. If this car wasn't so brimming with character and didn't feel so capable in many other ways, I would just discount it as a toy car. Because the gearbox, there are no words for how bad it is. But the saving grace is the engine, the turbo whistle, and the chassis. It's a confusing, conflicting car in my head because I should hate it for this gearbox. And I was really afraid when I got into it this morning that I would hate it because I've always admired these cars from a distance. I've always looked at them and thought that would be fun, but the gearbox scares me off. So I wouldn't want to buy one without first really experiencing it. But now I have experienced it, I would live with the gearbox. It's strange how these things work because put this gearbox in a family car and I wouldn't buy it. I would stay away from it forever. But as I've already waxed on about, this car is so lovable. It's so lovable. And I wish it was a lovely, beautiful day today so that A, I could have done in-person shots because it started pouring down once I did my B-roll and then I could have the roof open because that would be fantastic. But hey, here we are. And I'm still having massive amounts of fun with a huge, huge smile on my face. I mentioned earlier that Smart were hemorrhaging money and time, unfortunately, didn't come to save them. The 4.2 became a total cult car. And these were really successful for a little tiny sports car. They made 43,000 of them in less than three years, which is fantastic for an unknown manufacturer building a car that was tiny and could be specced up to something quite expensive if you wanted all the cool options. But between 2003 and 2006, Smart lost nearly four billion euros. Four billion, not million, billion. To add insult to injury, the roadsters terminally leaked water from around the cool target top system and and that meant that Smart was losing money on every single car they made. No matter the fact that they introduced this to try and expand their market, to try and make a little bit of money back from the platform the 4.2 was built on. But it just didn't work. I'm sure the higher ups at Daimler wish this car would never have existed, but that would be such a shame because it's fabulous fun. It would make such a difference if this car would have been manual, but cult classic, absolute cult classic, this thing. It's spectacular fun, looks brilliant, drives fantastically. I want one, I really, really want one. And the gearbox would not put me off, despite the fact it's absolutely dreadful. And on that note, thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, then please do click like and subscribe to TwinCam as well. I'm forever indebted to my wonderful Patreon supporters, so if you'd like to support me that way, then please do follow the link in the description. And I'll have more videos coming along soon.